Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar. On behalf of the National Transit Institute, I welcome you and thank you for participating. The National Transit Institute develops, promotes, and delivers training and education programs for the public transit industry in the United States. Today's webinar is entitled, Just How Important Are Service Design Models to ADA Paratransit? The Results of TCRP Synthesis 135. We are pleased to have Will Rodman as our presenter today. Last January, Will joined TSS Paratransit as its Vice President of Business Development, responsible for introducing TSS's paratransit software product, 5M, to the industry. Most of you know Will from his 40 years of consulting for Multisystems and Nelson slash Nygaard, where he became a nationally recognized go-to consultant for paratransit coordination, mobility management, and taxi regulations. Over the years, Will served as principal investigator and a contributor for several national research projects on paratransit for TRB and other organizations. One of his last projects for TRB was TCRP Synthesis 135 on ADA paratransit service models, and we'll be presenting some of those findings today. The session will consist of Will presenting his material, followed by a question and answer session at the end. You can participate in the discussion by using the chat pod that is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. I will be monitoring the chat pod during the presentation, and I will keep track of uh, the questions, and I will read them, moderate them at the end of the session. Um, if you haven't already printed out a copy or received a copy of the presentation, links were emailed to you. Um, they're also available in the handout section of the screen in the upper left-hand corner. And um, you can also copy and paste the links in the notes section. They're not clickable. You have to copy and paste into your browser, and you'll be able to get the handouts that way. Um, again, thanks, everyone. And I'm going to now turn the presentation over to Will. Will? Hey, okay. Thanks, Lori. And good afternoon to all of you east of the Rockies, and good morning to all of you on the West Coast. Um, I've been asked by TRB to present the findings of Synthesis 135 on ADA paratransit service models, and I want to thank Lori and all the nice folks at NTI for hosting this webinar. Um, uh, they've made uh, uh, m my job lots easier. Now, the synthesis uh, was undertaken um, and completed while I was still at Nelson Nygaard and was published by TRB earlier this year. And before I get going, I want to give a shout out to my co-author, William High, who is now a paratransit planner at Buncombe, Buncombe County, North Carolina, in Asheville, and I believe he's listening in on this. So for me, this project was a labor of love, having spent a good part of my 40-year consulting career designing the right service model for the right circumstances for paratransit systems all over the country, and Canada as well. So getting the perspective of 29 of the largest ADA paratransit systems in the U.S. was great fun for me, and I did learn some things. But before we get into the findings, let's get into some context first. Synthesis 135 delves into the ADA paratransit service models that transit agencies have implemented or are implementing to reduce costs while maintaining service quality and performance standards, to achieve a better balance between service quality and cost efficiency, and to enhance control and flexibility. So what defines a service model? Well, based on our literature review, it seemed to boil down to three things. First was the management structure. Who's providing what functions, and especially the four primary call center functions, of reservation, scheduling, dispatching, and responding to same-day customer issues, uh, the ever-famous where's my ride calls and ETA calls. So for example, is the transit agency itself performing some or all of these functions? And if only some, does the transit agency retain a broker or a call center manager to do the other functions? Or does the transit agency or broker assign these functions to the operations contractor or contractors? And if contractors are used, who's the contract holder? Is it the transit agency or a third-party broker? And to a lesser extent, who provides the facilities, the vehicles, the software, and other supporting assets? Now, a second aspect of the service model is how the work is organized if 
there are multiple carriers. So are there zones? Are there unzoned service packages? Is the work split temporally into heavy and light demand times or even by type of trip? And the third criteria is service mix, so the split between dedicated and non-dedicated service. So are taxis and or other non-dedicated service pro providers used and to what extent? So based on this three-part definition, we saw six primary management structures, which include an all-in-house model on the left there, uh, a split structure where certain functions are performed by the transit agency and where other functions are perform performed by the operations contractors. We have two different models involving brokers, one administrative where the carriers have turnkey contracts and the other with an operational bro broker performing some or all of the call center functions centrally. And note that with call center models, it's the transit agency that retains the contracts with the carriers. And that's the really the main differentiator between brokerage models and call center models. And finally, the very common turnkey model where one or more contractors are retained to perform all functions. And of course, there are nuances of these primary management structures. And this is really one of the reasons why the synthesis was ordered up. And if we look at the second part of the definition, we saw some interesting groupings in the way the service delivery network was organized where more than one service delivery contractor was used. And these generally broke down to decentralized call center functions where the same contractors who were operating the service were also assigned the responsibility for the call and control center functions. And here you generally find the contractors assigned to service areas or zones where, in most cases, customers are directed to call the carrier in their area of residence. And one notable exception in Los Angeles, it's based on the area in which the trip originates, including the return trip of the round trip. So this becomes a way of divvying up the work, but also organizing who the riders call for service. And in some cases, as with the former service model in Boston, in cases where riders live in overlapping areas, they call any of the carriers that serve that overlapping area, as long as their trip remains in that area. And for service models where at least reservations and scheduling are centralized with the transit agency, call and control center managers or brokers, you can have service zones, but the trend is not to have zones instead to have service packages where there are no zones and where the package entitles the contractor to a certain percentage of the work, uh, off defined by number of trips or runs. OK, so uh, with that kind of to setting up, uh, teeing up the discussion, our survey efforts involved inviting 32 agencies to participate. And there you see them all across the country. Uh, they were handpicked by our panel as they collectively reflected a wide range of service models and geography and demographics and size, although truthfully, they mainly ref reflected larger systems because smaller to mid-sized agencies tend to focus on two types of simpler management structures, all in-house or all turnkey. And while we did have them, we wanted to really focus on the wide variety of, of service models. And boy, did we find them. So of the 32, 29 participated. And this really amazed me, folks. Of the 29, there were 25 different service models, which I guess proves the old adage uh, that we all know about paratransit that everybody does it a little bit differently, and in some cases, a lot differently. So as the survey results came in, we attempted to group the paratransit systems and their service models so that they would make the most sense to the readers. And we found a logical split, even though there were some overlaps, based on who performed the four major call, call and control center functions, again, uh, reservation, scheduling, dispatching, and responding to customers' same-day issues.
So in the end, we wound up with three groups. The first group is where the transit agency performs one or more of the call center functions. Group two was where the transit agency retains a call center manager or a broker to perform one or more of the call center functions. And group three, where the dedicated service contractor or contractors perform one or more of the call center functions. Now, in group one, where again, where the transit agencies were taking the lead in one or more of the call center functions, there were 12 different agencies in the group and 12 different service models, and here they are. So among these 12, the call and control center functions that the transit agencies do perform are directly highlighted in green. Um, functions go across the top of the matrix, and agencies are going down the side. So also reflected in each matrix are a number of dedicated contractors, whether or not they use service zones, how many zones there are, and whether or not they use taxi or other non-dedicated service providers for ADA paratransit trips, and to what extent. And note, too, that even though alternative services, such as taxi or TNC-based subsidy programs, are not considered ADA paratransit services, even if they are provided to ADA, para ADA paratransit customers, we've included them over in the right-hand column for informational purposes and context. So we see here transit agencies like the one in Nashville, up top, that performs all the call and control center functions in-house all the way down to New York City, where transit agency staff perform just the scheduling, and the call center contractor is responsible for reservations and responding to same-day customer calls, and where dispatching is largely provided by the operations contract and pretty much everything in between. The synthesis provides a two-page two profile for each of the 29 agencies that participated. And each profile starts out with a graphic, uh, like this one for Pierce Transit, uh, that summarizes who does what, how the dedicated is work, work is split, the details of the service mix, and if taxis or non-dedicated service providers are used. And this is followed by um, sections that explain the division of responsibilities, base statistics, performance standards, background, how the whole thing works, um, contracting, the results, and lessons learned from the perspective of each survey respondent. And again, there's a two-page profile. Sometimes it's a little longer on each that covered all of this stuff. Um, as mentioned earlier, of the 29 agencies who participated in the survey, 12 performed some or all of the call center functions in-house, which kind of surprised me, because larger services tend to use contractors for these functions. So why? Because of cost and because once you bring functions in-house, it's very difficult to outsource in the future, as you know. Uh, now, this may be why only one of the 12 agencies performs all of the four of the call center functions in-house. Um, another fun fact that surprised me was that there were three agencies in Atlanta, Kansas City, and Las Vegas who opted to perform the reservation function in-house, but not the scheduling function. Um, the two reasons stated for performing in-house reservations and outsourcing the rest were to provide more direct control over service quality and to pave the way for operationalizing conditional eligibility. OK, so now we move on to the second group where transit agencies retain call and control center managers or brokers to perform one or more of the call and control center functions. And with this group, there were nine different transit agencies and eight different service models. Boom, and here they are. And similar to group one, I've highlighted the call and control center functions that are assigned to the call center manager but, or broker, 
Uh, this time they're highlighted in light blue. And as you'll probably notice, um, the list starts out with two transit agencies that you just saw in Group 1, Kansas City and New York, and that's because there's an overlap between the two groups. Now, in most cases, you'll see that all four of the call and control center functions are, in fact, provided by the call and control center management contractor or broker. And notably, six of the nine have centralized dispatching, which, when I was just a rookie 40 years ago, seemed pretty far-fetched to me. But DART in Dallas was really the first one to pioneer centralized dispatching uh, with multiple carriers, um, albeit with the transit agency staff. And then others followed suit, but with third-party contractors doing the dispatching, uh, along with other call and control center functions. Um, so the old model where dispatches is vested with operations contractors still exists in the other three New York, uh, Broward County, it's, uh, in Florida where Fort Lauderdale is, and Chicago. And speaking of Chicago, PACE has a service model unlike I have ever seen. In Chicago, PACE has three zone-based contractors, service delivery contractors, and one that handles longer trips. Now, the three zone-based carriers were largely turnkey contractors, much like you'll be seeing in Group 3 when we get there. However, a few years ago, PACE changed this to include a centralized scheduling performed by a third-party entity that also kind of on the side does more broad-based call and control centers for or functions for some of the paratransit systems in PACE's suburban counties. So the way this works is that the zones in Chicago dictate who a rider books a trip with, but from there, all the trip requests are scheduled by that third-party entity and afterwards are assigned to vehicles that could be operated by any of the four carriers. So just because as a customer you call one carrier, you may not wind up on that carrier's vehicles if it's the most efficient way to do it. So note that the same-day issue calls also go to that third-party entity in Chicago. So with this model, PACE stated that it wanted to take advantage of scheduling expertise and objectivity. So here's an example of one of the nine, this one in Denver with the RTD hiring a call and control manager to do all four functions, and with three primary contractors providing dedicated service and with a smaller taxi company providing a mixture of dedicated and non-dedicated service for about 10% of the trips. Now, one of the cool things that Denver does is they bid out the primary, the non-taxi work, in four 25% zone-less packages. And they call in the procurement process for proposals for one or two packages, but no more than two. And in this way, no one contractor will have more than 50% of the work, and that's exactly what happened as a result of the latest procurement. Uh, one of the carriers was awarded two of the package, and hence does 50% of the work of the non-taxi work, and the other two um, do the remainder, uh, split evenly. So you'll also remember from earlier that only nine of the 29 agencies reported that they utilize a call center manager or a broker, and of these nine, all but one have a call center or a call or a call center control center contractor, the latter indicating that dispatching is also performed centrally by the contractor. So if you're, if you're going to centralize these functions with a third-party contractor, the trend seems to be to use a call and control center manager and not a broker because transit agencies want to have more contractual control and direct control over the operators rather than vest the contractual control with a broker. And the reason stated for going with a control center manager or broker to bring objectivity to the scheduling and dispatching functions to save costs, and that's versus uh, in-house or multiple turnkey contractor solution. The downside stated, it adds another layer of management. It can sometimes lead to finger pointing if the responsibilities are not delineated properly and clearly. And affecting change can be more cumbersome than if you perform the function directly. And lastly, 
if you do go with a broker, an additional benefit is the transfer of risk. Now we move to the third group, where the transit agencies vest one or more call and control center functions with the contractor or contractors they hire for service delivery. Now this was by far the largest group, with 18 different transit agencies uh, and 15 different service models. And here they are. Sounds like I'm in the prices right. OK. So you may notice that there's some significant overlap here with the other groups. For example, the first five transit agencies also belong to the first group, where one or more of the call center functions are performed by the transit agency staff, and the rest are performed by service delivery contractors. So the next three after that are from group two that similarly assign some of the functions to the, either the call center manager or broker and the rest to the, to the service delivery contractor. And in this matrix, you see that the functions shaded in light brown are those performed by the dedicated contractor or contractors. Uh, there are more in the next slide, and I'll get to that in a sec. And once you get beyond the first eight, you start to get into the turnkey contractor land, where there's one or more contractors responsible for all four of the call center functions. And here are the remaining one, two, three, four, five, six, all of which have turnkey contractor or contractors. OK. So here's a particular interesting example of a group three transit agency, DART in Dallas, where they re retain one primary contractor to do all the call and control center functions. And that entity also operates 30% of the trip, with the taxi subcontractor handling the remaining 70% of the trips. Um, and so much of the consulting work that I did before joining TSS, I was noticing that there's an absolute trend in, uh, in transit agencies using more and more taxis and other non-dedicated service providers um, for ADA paratransit. And now in, in the Dallas case, 70% of the trips go to the taxi subcontractor um, that I was mentioning, noting that most um, of those trips have been scheduled and runs operated by taxi drivers, but many are non-dedicated as well. Now, in the case of the 18 agencies in Group 3, half, half have only one contractor, noting that most of these are, are one carrier turnkey contracts, while the others use multiple service providers split between zones, service models, and unzoned service packages. Now, these statements or the statements from these survey respondents were all on the same page in terms of advantages and disadvantages. The first was retaining contractors are generally less expensive. Uh, retaining one turnkey contractor is generally less expensive because there's no duplication of functions, but it can be risky because you're putting all your eggs in one basket. And three, retaining multiple providers fosters more competition and makes it easy to adjust the volume of service among the contractors, especially if zones are not used. But it can also result in duplication of effort and inconsistent service quality. So with the time left, I want to first address the use of taxis and other non-dedicated service providers for ADA paratransit, and uh, again, to be distinguished from alternative services like, like taxi subsidy programs. I was kind of surprised that only 10 of the 29 incorporated this into their service models. But I was also surprised to see some, as I was mentioning earlier, some very large increases in the use of taxis and taxi subcontractors compared to 2005 when I authored the TCRP Report 121 on integrating non-dedicated vehicles in paratransit. 
Now, in the slide, I mentioned four agencies um, in New York City, in Los Angeles, in Dallas, and Phoenix that have used taxis, or in the case of New York City, black cars, to serve significant portions of their trips. So why are they doing this? Because it reduces overall operational unit cost. Now, some of these 10 agencies also acknowledge that there's a difference in service quality, and it's probably that worry that has kept many of the other 19 agencies from introducing this kind of service mix, but some of the 10 have stated that more hands-on training has helped bridge that service quality gap. Lastly, about two-thirds of the respondents use multiple service providers. All but one use between two and six providers, and two-thirds of these use zones, while the rest use unzoned service packages. And of those who do use zones, the agency stated that the model makes the service more manageable, especially with larger systems. Um, it enhances competition, but only during procurement. And it can improve productivity if the zones are well designed, warning that if the zones are related policies result in lots of deadheading, then of course productivity will suffer. Now the agencies that use unzoned service packages in comparison state that a package model typically results in less deadheading and higher productivities and it gives the transit agency more flexibility in making adjustments to those packages um, over the, you know, during the contract period. And hence, it, generation, it generates continuous competition, not just in the procurement, but all throughout the contract term. And that promulgates improvements in service quality. OK, so before I say goodbye, there are a slew of additional findings related to alternative services, uh, contracting do's and don'ts, a bit more detail on using multiple carriers. And this, is, this was um, maybe or may not be, I don't know, uh, exciting to all you guys out there. There's a new glossary of paratransit terms that the FTA has blessed. And uh, hopefully that will be helpful to you. Um, Lori wanted me to mention also that there's more research in the area of alternative services um, and that, that's clearly warranted. And in particular, are transit agencies winning what I've often referred to as the financial bet? Uh, that is, are the savings that result from the diversion of trips from ADA paratransit service to an alternative service, are those savings greater than the additional subsidy associated with the new trips generated by that cool new subsidy service? And how do transit agencies figure that out? So if there is a, if there is a need for uh, uh, one kind of, uh, one particular research item, um, I think that's it. Um, so with that, um, here's the intuitively obvious link for the synthesis. But um, I love the fact that TCRP has a folder called blurbs, which I use all the time. So way to go, TCRP. Um, or if you simply Google TCRP synthesis, 135, uh, you'll get there too. Um, so this is me. That's been a, that's my labor of love. Uh, you've been a lovely audience. This is my business card, which doesn't quite fit in my pocket, but this is how to get a hold of me. And uh, I do have some smaller versions that I can send you. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, who TSS Paratransit is. We have a software called 5M that's um, uh, used for all things paratransit and is, uh, is pretty cool. Um, and that's why I switched from the consulting world to the software world. So that's it. Um, and I now would be, would love to entertain any questions. <clears throat> okay. So 
some of the slides didn't have numbers on it, so I don't know if I always got the exact slide the question popped up on correctly. I was trying to estimate. Um, but way back around slide 14, um, Michael Ebeg said, the New York model confuses me. Do they have a call center just to receive calls, but don't do any actual work of arranging the service? Agency schedule, DSC dispatches, and a little more detail would be helpful. So sort of okay. a question slash comment. Okay, so so it's a great question, and it indeed is 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 very unique. Um, when you go down to that that uh, 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 call and call center, it's it's sometimes confusing who works for the call center manager and who works for the transit agency. So the way it works in New York, let's take the it's function by function. The call center contractor. Uh, provides the reservation agents. The, the New York City Transit staff who are assigned to that call center are responsible for scheduling. Years ago, um, uh, in a former call center manager, that entity was uh, responsible for the scheduling function. The transit agency thought it could do better, and so it's now responsible for um, that scheduling. The schedules then go out to the 17, I right know, how many are there? 13 different service provider contractors. They provide their own uh, dispatching, although the call center uh, uh, staff, a uh, call center manager staff, kind of monitors what's going on and if there's any kind of help with dispatching that they think might be needed there they uh, um, they contribute that on the same day basis and then in terms of handling the customers ETA calls and where's my ride calls the call center manager does that so absolutely uh, four different functions split between three different entities um, also, um, New York's a little unique because they have, for, for the trips that are not scheduled onto uh, those 13 provider dedicated vehicles, um, depending on where the trip is, it's sloughed off to two non-dedicated service provider brokers who then broker those trips to black cars. Um, so that's fairly unique as well. Um, they also, there's way to the right, have uh, both TNC-based and taxi-based subsidy programs on the side, and they use that for a variety of reasons, um, offering it to uh, some folks who actually call in for an ADA trip and in some cases, there's an offer to take a taxi instead. Sometimes uh, uh, somebody who's stranded and they're just having difficulty getting a dedicated vehicle to, to get that person is offered that as an option. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of unique stuff happening in New York City. Cool. Uh, the next question was from around slide 16-ish. From Karen Lee, it says, "Do you know why the agency separated reservations and scheduling?" Again, it might not be slide 16, but yeah, um, um, there were there were two reasons. Uh, let's see if I can get to the correct uh, slide. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure out what slide I was I was doing that. Um, well, I'll tell you. Hey, let's go back to. Uh, back to here. Now, if you look, you'll see that, um, let's see, in, Las, in Atlanta, in um, uh, number 9, number 10, Las Vegas, and number 11, Kansas City, the uh, agency is, 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 for the most part, doing the reservations while the scheduling 
is done either by the service provider contractor, in the case of Atlanta and Las Vegas, or the call center contractor, in the case of Kansas City. And I think I may have mentioned this, but the two reasons that the three of them stated for separating the two um, was they wanted more direct uh, control and consistent service quality in the function that interfaces with customers. And the second reason, reason, and even though none of those three were doing this per se, they wanted to pave the way for more direct control over operationalizing conditional eligibility. And they felt that if that was extended to the, especially to a contractor who's also doing service delivery and basically gets paid the more work they do, that there'd be a conflict of interest there. OK, hopefully that answered. I guess I'll wait for feedback. Um, Ian Dedimore said, around the same time, said, does this rise in taxi subcontracting present any service equity concerns? Riders with the most severe disabilities will be restricted to van use and are likely getting shared service trips, while the more ambulatory passengers are using the taxis and getting exclusive direct service? Well, um, in many cases, the, the use of taxis for non sorry, for um, ADA paratransit service um, often involves uh, accessible vehicles. For example, in Dallas, where 70% of the trips are done by uh, taxi, uh, the taxi subcontractor there. Um, I'm not sure if every vehicle is left equipped, but I'm pretty sure that most of them are. And so there's an equity uh, you know, solution there. And um, in a lot of those, in, in Los Angeles, for example, um, with two, actually with all four now of the primary contractors, they're using software products that can cluster trips together that are then dispatched as a cluster or as a group to taxis. And so in this particular case, and in Los Angeles, they, they have about 50% of the trips done by taxis. Many of them are shared ride service and not exclusive. So um, I think the you know, when, when you equate taxis with um, only serving ambulatory folks and exclusive service, it's not, uh, it's not quite right with a good majority of these folks. OK. Now we're at, around the last slide, uh, Lewis Lowry said, agencies that have moved to a heavier use of taxis, are those trips primarily non-ADA services? Um, well, there, there were, let's see, um, let me go to that slide. Here we go. So you'll notice that the, um, the title of the slide was for ADA paratransit trips. So nine, so there were 10 actually who do use taxis, or in the case of New York City, uh, black cars, to provide ADA paratransit service. Much more prevalent is the use of taxis and now TNCs for, uh, for, not, for alternative services such as taxi subsidy programs or TNC taxi programs and those are non-ADA paratransit even though they are even though ADA paratransit customers may be the only ones eligible so so with that I'm not exactly sure if I answered the the question but um, it seems like that both the use of, of taxis for, um, for ADA paratransit trips 
and the use of taxis and TNCs and, and livery operators for non-ADA alternative services, um, actually non-ADA paratransit alternative services, are both increasing in popularity. And the, the reason for the first, the, the, and, and this is um, explored a lot in that and that TCRP study I did back in 2005 is that the, the service mix, there, there's a very strategic way that taxis can be used to serve peak overflow trips, um, uh, trips at low demand times and in low demand areas, um, uh, long out of the way trips that aren't uh, very ride shareable, and and that's a those are great uses for taxis, and it it has the effect of increasing the productivity of the dedicated fleet when you use the taxi fleets for for trips that otherwise would adversely affect the productivity on the dedicated side, and at a cer certain optimal point, the overall unit cost is minimized. And what we've seen is more and more folks doing this. Now, in the case of using TNCs in the same way for ADA paratransit, um, nobody has quite done that yet because of the driver issues. You know, the, you know, the taxi industry solved this long ago by offering uh, to independent taxi drivers the option of getting trained and drug and alcohol testing and all the things you have to do to become a, to become a quote unquote certified ADA driver. And uh, many of those taxi drivers uh, volunteered to do that and that's why you see a lot of the systems around the country using taxis for that. And you know, moving over to TNCs, um, um, Uber and Lyft and, and others um, um, haven't made a similar offer to their drivers because uh, they're trying to stay away from the employer-employee relationship. So enter in something that they are thinking about and I believe planning for in Nashville. Um, so, so in Nashville, the thought is and the concept that they're planning is to hire a third party entity who will be responsible for recruiting and certifying and brokering overflow trips to TNC drivers who they recruit. So this has nothing to do with Lyft or Uber as companies. They're kind of doing an end around here. And um, if it works out, then it becomes another resource that's available um, to them. And if you think about it, it's just what the taxi industry did years ago and continues to do. You've got taxi drivers out there who are getting dispatch trips from their own taxi association. Some of them are partnering with Lyft and Uber. Some of them are getting trips coming in from the transit agency for ADA trips. It's, it's really no different as long as those drivers are certified. So, um, so that's, a, that's ADA paratransit. On the, on the non-ADA paratransit side, there are the, the taxi drivers who are participating, again, voluntarily, in subsidy programs. Um, the cool thing for the ADA paratransit customers is there's another mobility option at same day, if not immediate, hot cha. And um, for the transit agency, it's not only the ability, the opportunity to provide this cool new mobility option to the customers, but also to potentially save some money. And that's the, that's the financial bet that I was talking about earlier. Okay, um, so I'm going through the chat box. There seems to be some questions and there's a conversation going on, so I'm not sure if 
I should read all that or try to pick out what the questions are. Um, okay, so we just answered, uh, I think we answered Michael Abegg's question. And then under that, Ian Dedimore says, uh, partly firing off Mr. Abegg's question, I don't know if that was the first question or the second one, is there a reason this seems largely focused on large urban agencies and not smaller urban and rural service providers? And then Karen Lee said, I agree with Michael, it would be good to see this analysis on smaller systems. Well, the, the reason we did was we wanted to look at varieties of service models. And in the, uh, the smaller and rural um, models, what we saw almost, almost universally was that the service model was one of two, and one of the two, the, the two simpler ones. It was either they all did it in-house or they just used a, a, a turnkey contractor. So we wanted to make sure that those two models were represented in the uh, in, in the survey, and we did do that, but we didn't want you know given the the budget that we had available, we were more interested in exploring different types of service models, and they were found mostly in the uh, the larger transit agencies. Okay, hopefully that took care of that. Um, M. Sadler at Indigo.net asked, what is the difference between a contractor and a broker? Ah, good question. It, let me go back to the, uh, the, the original graphic. Ba -dum, ba -dum. There we go. OK, so we're talking about the fourth and fifth column. So when you hire a broker, a transit agency contracts with a broker and it says, you figure this out. You, you manage the system. You plan the system. Uh, you, you do what, uh, 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 whatever function you want to do internally and, and, and slough off the rest of the contractors. But you control that with direct contracts with those contractors. And that's that line going down towards the, the left, where it, where it says contracts. The difference between a brokerage model and a call and control center module or manager is that the transit ag agency reserves the contracting function to directly contract with the service contractors. And it has another contract with a call and control center manager. And the reason that that seems to be the trend is that transit agencies have now figured this all out, and they want a direct control over the service provider contract. They don't want to relinquish that control to the call and control center manager. You know, when, when brokerages were more prevalent in the late 70s and certainly in the 80s, um, a lot of the transit agencies were relatively inexperienced with paratransit. They went with a professional broker who, who understood paratransit better and all the nuances, and, and that's why brokerages were, were much more prevalent then. And then um, that seemed to segue in the 90s and, and beyond into call and control center managers where you're getting the expertise for reservation scheduling, in some cases dispatching. Um, but again, the transit agency in, in that model retains the direct contracting function with the service delivery contractors. So it's really the contracting holder is, is, is the main difference between the two. Excellent. Um, the next question is from, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. I think it's, it's either it's Ashad Hamada. Um, 
Alternative services, such as provided by TNCs, are discussed, quote, tangentially, tangent, oh my gosh, this is embarrassing. And tangentially. tangentially. Yeah. <laughs> no. Tangent. <laughs> All right, everyone, direct your attention to the word that I can't pronounce right now. That's because I was eating sunflower seeds. My tongue isn't working. Ah. In a synthesis. <laughs> there, are several, there are several pilots, including TNCs, providing paratransit services. Do you think TNCs can result in service and cost efficiencies as an alternative to ADA complementary paratransit services? How can the service that TNC can provide as an alternative to ADA paratransit service or as complementary paratransit service be eligible for federal funds? Okay. Well, a bunch of questions there. Yes, yeah, a lot. Um, um, there are examples um, around the country. There's one right here where I am in Boston. There's one in Las Vegas. Um, uh, I think there, oh, there's one in Dallas, where uh, TNCs are providing an alternative service for ADA paratransit customers. They're the only ones eligible for this. Excuse me. And many of them, many of the customers do take advantage of this immediate um, immediate response opportunity where they the customers pay a certain fare and the uh, much of the subsidy is covered by the transit agency it's no different from the taxi subsidy programs that have been around for years um, and have uh, you know, in, in, in many cases, um, federal funds aren't used for that. I believe in Boston they are not used. Um, not sure about the others, but even if they are, they would fall under the same ground rules as the taxi subsidy programs, which um, are, you know, have been blessed by the FTA. So, you know, really no different there. You know, are they, are they providing a, another mobility option for these folks? You bet. Um, are they saving money? Um, in certain cases, they are. And you know, that, hence, that uh, kind of segues to the, um, the area of new research that I was pointing to, that, that um, some folks um, over the years, you know, for example, uh, in Denver, their alternative service is called uh, Accessa Cab, and that's been in place for, oh gosh, 10 or 15 years maybe. And the folks at RTD will tell you that absolutely they're, uh, they're winning the financial bet there. And interestingly, in, in Denver, the calls for this alternative service do not go to the taxi company. They go to the same call center that the ADA paratransit trips do. And there they are given a choice of which taxi company they would like to use. And those requests are, um, are forwarded on to the taxi company in, by choice. And in, by, by using that approach, you know absolutely who it is who's using the system, and you can take a look at their before and after use of Accessor Ride, the ADA paratransit service there, and to determine whether you know the, the trip that they're taking um, would likely have been um, on the ADA paratransit system or a new trip looking at the before and after uh, ridership levels on the ADA paratransit service for that customer and making the call. And RTD staff over the years have said, yes, we are winning that financial bet. Um, in New York City, going back to them, they do something really interesting on the intake. Um, after uh, after the ADA paratransit trip request is taken by a reservation agent, um, some of the reservation agents there, and under 
under certain circumstances of the trip, I'm not exactly sure of the ground rules, um, will say to the customer, how would you like a taxi trip instead? And some of them do, about 5% of them. Um, now, you know that that trip would have been taken um, on the ADA paratransit service because that's what they called for. Now, um, why is it only 5%? Uh, uh, it's because the reimbursement system is cumbersome. Basically, customers get an authorization number. They go out. They get a taxi trip on their own. They get the receipt. They send in the receipt with the authorization number back into New York City Transit, and they get reimbursed base, you know, less a, less a, 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 a base fare. So it's, um, it's a little cumbersome. Um, I believe, but I'm not 100% sure, they are venturing into uh, TNC land for the same kind of thing. Um, and in any of these cases, they aren't steering folks there. They are just making the offer. And that's, um, that's a key requirement uh, to alternative services from the standpoint of the FTA. Okay. Um, there seems to be a conversation going on between Karen and Ian, and I'm not sure uh, if we need to read that. They were sort of chatting with each other, which is totally fine and welcomed. Um, sure. <clears throat> so Ian said you answered his question before. Uh, the latest question to come in on that list, and I'm sorry, Karen and Ian, if I missed something in that exchange there that you did want to ask Will, please. Um, let me know in the chat box. Um, Roosevelt Stripling says, are the taxi trips shared ride trips or direct to destination? Oh. These are, these are taxi trips that I'm presuming you mean where taxis or other TNCs um, are, I'm sorry, no, sorry, taxis or other livery operators are used for ADA paratransit trips. And in those cases, they are both. Um, sometimes they just happen to be exclusive ride. There's nothing requiring that they be exclusive. And I think um, you may remember I gave the Los Angeles example where the software that they're using um, clusters trips into groups that are then dispatched to taxis. So in many cases, um, they are shared ride trips that the taxi folks are doing too, and that um, certainly improves productivity. Great. Um, that seems to be the last question. I see people are typing, but they could very well be typing to each other. I yeah. wish there was a way to tell. Oh, you, you know, have... it's okay. If this, if this webinar um, spurs on side conversation, I think that's <laughs> This is true, but I just see that people are typing, but it, they, they might be in private chat, so we don't actually, uh -oh. not even I can see uh -oh. what's going on in the private chat. <laughs> I think I might like to, actually. Um, okay, so let's just wait a little bit longer and see if any more questions are coming in. There'll be some uncomfortable silence while we wait. Huh? I can have the Jeopardy theme if you want. Yeah, really? <laughs> Oh, okay. So uh, Fran says, mm -hmm. well, that's not really a question, Fran. It says you were stating that you cannot steer people to TNCs. It's, it's sure. right. When, whenever you have an alternative service, oh. uh, whether it be a taxi-based subsidy program, whether it's a TNC-based ta uh, subsidy program, doesn't matter. Whenever you have an alternative service, um, you can't um, it, it's an offer. Um, um, you, you can't steer people to this, and that's part of the FTA definition as well. Now, in, in ADA land, if you have a non-dedicated service provider, you can, you know, the whole point is that the, the folks that determine who, you know, if you're going to be on a dedicated vehicle or a taxi or whatever, are the schedulers and the dispatchers. And they're going to try and put together 
um, the most efficient, cost-efficient um, way to do it so that uh, the unit cost is uh, minimized. You know, when I did that study way back when, you know, a lot of the transit agencies who were in that study, they were mostly, you know, about 5 to 15 percent of the trips were being served by non-dedicated service provider. And I have seen that range go up and up and up uh, across the country. Um, you know, again, a couple examples. In, in uh, New York, it's 30 percent. In, in Los Angeles, it's 50 percent. In, in Dallas, it's 70 percent. And in, up until recently in Phoenix, in suburban Phoenix, it was more like around 100 percent. And the reason they are doing this is, is uh, if you have drivers who are certified ADA drivers, they're, they're um, trained by the same standards to proficiency, they participate in drug and alcohol testing, uh, they're insured probably everything that the van drivers have, then you can, you can assign an ADA paratransit trip to that person. Um, most taxi drivers are independent contractors. Um, they don't have uh, the same employee benefits, for example. Um, and you know, we can have a long discussion about that. But the, the the long story short is that it does. It's a more effective, cost-effective way to provide trips that otherwise would adversely affect the productivity of the dedicated fleet. And if you use them strategically in that way, um, it lowers the cost without diminishing um, service quality. So that's the reason more and more folks are using it. Also, I found when I was doing a, a comprehensive operational uh, re review in Los Angeles, you know, we, one of the things we found was that it was becoming increasingly more difficult to to recruit drivers for dedicated service, and this was because you know the economy. You know, when uh, when Amazon is 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 offering higher wages than the paratransit system, um, you know, you, you see a def a defection there, and so. Part of the, the increase in use of taxis um, in Los Angeles was because of this. And even though TNCs in general have been eating into the taxi market, as all of you well know, of the taxi drivers that have stuck it out, more and more want to become certified as ADA certified drivers so that they have this stream of of uh, trips that are coming to them. So those are the dynamics that we've been seeing. Okay. Um, right after that, Fran had a follow-up question, so I'm I'm not sure if you. Hey, answered. Pat Pyrus, hiya. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, we don't want to forget Ashad. Um, okay. All right. You mentioned in a recent commentary that transit agencies will need new generation technology platform that did not take the same old approach. Can you provide details? How can new technologies be applicable to taxi service providers? And then we can go to Pat. Oh, um, well, I, I think you know, one of the um, ideas, well, it's twofold, really. Um, one that, you know, there are, Many of the software products that are out there have relied on scheduling and routing algorithms that are are really pretty ancient. You know, they all many of them came out of MIT in the last in the late 70s, and uh, you know, Pat will remember uh, Haddonfield. You know, one of the original ones, and those those routing algorithms haven't changed all that much. Um, what you're seeing now are, are newer technologies that in the routing process um, um, are, are, are going about the, the routing differently, but the main idea is that they are taking 
non-dedicated service provider resources into account. And that's especially true um, in, in the day of with dispatching or near dynamic scheduling. So these kinds of, um, I think, think these kinds of, of software uh, and, and advances in new technologies you're going to see more and more. Okay, then now we can go to Pat. <laughs> okay. Well, Pat had a comment, not a question, because it ex says that explicitly. Um, people in California may want to follow the implementation of SB 1376, signed by the governor, which starts some study work, but also allows what may be discriminatory response times or lack of service to wheelchair users. Oh, yeah, okay. it's a great point, as, as Pat usually has them. Um, one of the, the, the truisms and requirements for these alternative services is um, equivalency of service. And so um, if, it, it's, a, it's a deal breaker if you can't do it. So, so you know, the, the comment is spot on that in these taxi-based subsidy programs and the TNC-based subsidy programs, if equivalent service is not provided, and, you know, by equivalent response times um, to persons using wheelchairs, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not in compliance with, with the ADA. It's, it's, uh, it's a deal breaker. So that's, that, that has to be done. And um, they've taken great care in Boston, for example, um, to make sure that's the case. Um, and, and I've seen different ways that TNCs have done this. Um, whether it's the infusion of uh, wheelchair vehicles to using a third-party contractor of theirs to do it. Um, the last time, um, and this was a few months ago, that I was paying attention to uh, the response times in Boston for uh, customers in wheelchairs, it was in the order of about five minutes. Which, which seemed fairly uh, equivalent to ambulatory service. So they, they were meeting the letter of the law there. I can't speak for the other ones, but they know that that is a requirement. So, and, and Pat's absolutely right. So Pat, I yeah. hope I get a hug from you next time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's one more question from Fran. Um, I, I don't know if this is a follow-up or clarification from earlier. It says, uh, can you contract with the TNC for subsidy service? Currently, we just use taxis. I would like to have more people bid on our contract by opening it up to TNCs. Any issue with this? Um, OK, let me, wait. Let me read this the, the, again. I, I see it here. Can OK, sorry. The for subsidy? Yes, you can. Currently, we just use taxis and would like to have more people bid on our contract. But yes, and, and I think. Um, my suggestion would be to contact either the MBTA in Boston, um, uh, RTC in Las Vegas. Um, they have pretty good contracts um, with the TNCs to make sure that they are abiding by the letter of the law and getting the data. Uh, there, there's a, there's a, a misconception out there that uh, that TNCs involved in such programs are reluctant to give you the data. Listen, if you're a transit agency and you want them and, and, and you would like them and they want to play, they have to play by the contractual rules and part of that is getting the data you need. So in the cases, in those particular cases, they are getting the data. Um, let's see if I've answered that question. Uh, so, so you know, other than uh, the ground rules for general um, um, subsidy programs, which I mentioned, um, no issue. Okay. There's a few more people typing. Uh, Francis, thank you. That answers the question. Hey, I'm getting my uh, hug from Pat. All right. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm, uh, oh, uh, 
Assad said, are Boston and Las Vegas using federal funds to pay TNC? Boston is not, and I'm, I don't know about Las Vegas, but I don't think so, but I'm not 100% certain. But, okay. you, know, uh, you know, for me, again, as long as you, you um, abide by the same kind of ground rules and policies that affect um, or that impact or, or, or guide taxi subsidy programs um, that have used federal dollars for years, um, I think you're okay. You know, one of the misnomers that I, I, I this drove me nuts when I was a consultant, is that um, the, the, just a taxi subsidy program, there was some, there was an FTA policy that said uh, customers have to have uh, a choice between two different taxi companies. Now, somehow I think that got mangled um, over the years. Um, I, I think that the, the original premise was they had to have a choice. It couldn't be forced on them. This was an offer. Because you know how many taxi subsidy programs in this country only have one taxi company uh, participating? And, and, you know, you, you go into some smaller towns, they only got one, and you've got into others, and maybe one doesn't want to play, or you're going to screw up the whole system because of that. And there are tons of examples, again, across the country, where there's only one uh, uh, taxi entity involved in a taxi subsidy program. I believe federal funds are used for that, and they have flown through the, the uh, triennial reviews. So there's a lot of inconsistency going on there, and I think... You know, the, uh, w one of the things the FTA has to do is, w especially with all these MOD sandbox things going on, is take a look at that, uh, take a look at that policy and maybe revisit it. I'll probably have a whole bunch of people at the FTA mad at me at that, but that's uh, as long as it's directed at you and not me. Yeah, yeah. Pat and I are probably in good company there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want them. I don't want them getting mad at me. Um, yeah. Antoinette says that Las Vegas is not using federal funding. Okay. Um, well, there you go. Oh, Antoinette. Hi. Good to see you. Or, or kind of good to read you. <laughs> Your friends are checking in. Good to read you. Um, I'm gonna. It's three fifteen. I'm gonna do last call. <laughs> Antoinette says hi. Well, um, I'm gonna do last call for questions. Um, well, maybe if you put up your last slide, I think they had, did have your contact information on it and they could reach yeah. out to you directly? Sure. Um, I will be, you know, even though I am not a quote-unquote consultant anymore, um, whoops, how did they do that? Wait a second. Uh, Uh-oh. I can't help you. It's your screen. I went too far. Did yeah, you have to do this. Wait a second. Okay. Wait. Do the slideshow. Oh, there it is. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay. So, so um, I, I am, as as all of you know, or many of you probably know, I'm a consultant at heart and done it for 40 years, and I will continue to do so. So, if you have any questions, um, please just give me a call. Uh, you can use my cell phone right there, the 617 number, or the 818 will get it to me as well. Um, and, uh, but, you know, do get the report. There is a, gosh, there's a, a, a treasure trove of information in there. And it should be helpful. And you can see what other folks are doing, why they did it, and what they think the lessons learned are. And that's, um, you know, I didn't have time today to go through all 29 of them, but um, just I wanted to hit the high points. But there's some... Um, there are definitely some themes, and uh, I hope it's helpful for you. Thank you so much, Will. Um, Mariella uh, has a little message. I don't. It says, uh, from TRB and TCRP, we wanted to thank Will and the panel for all their hard work on this synthesis of, pra of practice. Great job. Um, don't, whoops, scrolling. Don't forget to download the synthesis. Um, and I just, that reminded me I wanted to mention, uh, in the handout, the top item, it says TCRP Synth 135 report. That's the actual report. So if you click on that, it should start downloading immediately um, for anybody who wants a copy of that. Oh, cool. um, also, I'm seeing some comments about uh, the transcript. 
So my screen as the host looks a little different than uh, what the participants see. So in the captions, if you don't have an option to save, and I am not 100% sure that you do, you can try hitting it if you do have it, and that might save it for you. If not, shoot me an email um, so that I have your email, and I will send you my copy of the transcript. My email is l-g-l-i-c-k-m-a-n at n-t-i dot rutgers dot edu. Um, Karen says there is a save button, so try that. If it doesn't work, again, shoot me an email. Um, last call for questions. I think we seem to be wrapping it up, but I just want to give anyone else a chance. Nobody's well, I hope everybody's had some fun. I did. Um, it was uh, great uh, seeing some old friends who I haven't seen in a while show up, and uh, hope it's useful, and hope I've been of help. Thank you so much. Well, I, I want to thank everyone who participated. And Will, your presentation was great, and there was a lot of great questions. That's an excellent, you know, that's excellent feedback if people are asking a lot of questions, I, I think. Um, as a reminder to everybody still out there, you will be receiving an invitation to fill out an evaluation survey. Uh, if you please just take a couple of minutes and do that, it, it really helps, and NTI really appreciates your feedback. So thanks, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Will. Bye.